Hi, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is a watercolor channel that deals with impressionistic uh, styles and techniques. So I hope you're in the right place. Um, if there are any golfers out there today, I wanna start with my little opener showing a few of my favorite golf memes. Uh, this is the first one. I found a wood that can lower my score. It's called a pencil. Golf is like taxes. You drive hard to make the green, then end up in the hole. I like that one. There's a lot of luck in golf, most of it bad. Do you think it's a sin to play on Sunday? The way you play, sir, it's a sin to play any day. <laughs> Why do golfers wear two pairs of trousers? It's in case they get a hole in one. And this is my favorite. It probably needs a little bit of setting up. Four golf clubs go into a bar, three irons and one wood. And the bartender brings them drinks and the wood says, no thanks, I'm the driver. I like that one. Anyway, what does golf have to do with watercolor? Just this. The two are alike in that the fewer strokes you take, the better the outcome. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. And that is the idea that less is more in watercolor, just like it is in golf. What you choose to leave out of your painting can be just as important as what you choose to include. I know it's kind of an oxymoron, but the more you leave out, the more people seem to see in it. It is really a good idea to leave some things uh, in your paintings unfinished or undescribed, unsaid, and not act as if you're a camera. A camera doesn't have a brain, but you do. Um, let's think about how the eye looks at a scene. Especially if we're just passing by something, we don't see everything with sharp edges and crisp detail. Some things are blurred in our peripheral vision as our eyes focus on what we're looking at straight on. Well, less is more um, is a saying that we hear all the time, but why exactly is it important in painting? I think that it has to do with the idea that the more we can do to captivate the viewer in our work, the more appealing or interesting it will be. By leaving some things unsaid, it will leave a mystery that begs solving in the mind of the viewer. I just read an article um, about an artist that I really admire, Joseph Sabukovich, in which he said, if I define everything, it becomes boring. There's nothing more boring than a perfect circle, but if you make some dots in a broken circle, your eye will be drawn to it to complete it. It's an optical illusion. The viewer is more engaged if things are suggested rather than completed by the pa painter. So I want to just show you a little example of this idea. I have painted four circles here on this little strip of watercolor paper. The top one um, indicates a completed filled in circle. The, the width of the stroke is all, of this, all the same. It's very monotonous and it's also very um, attention capturing, your eye goes right there and stays there. But on these next three down, the second one down, I have done what Joseph said, which is to leave a space in the circle that's missing and just connect it maybe with a dot. And that um, catches your eye right here. The viewer is drawn to that to finish that off in our mind. Our mind has the... Um, the desire or the ability to complete that in our, in our mind. The next one down, I've used a variety of edge in the stroke, which leaves uh, just a more pleasing shape. It's, it's, not a, it's not a harsh shape and it's not a finished shape. So that, that's a lot more pleasing to the eye. And then the next one down, I've tried to include a little bit of dry brush, which also um, leaves an opening there for your eye to, to um, 
leave the circle. Up here, you're, you're caught. You're caught within that um, boundary because there's no escaping for the eye or no entering for the eye. So that's just a little bit about um, showing you, I think, what Joseph Sabukovich was trying to say. It's um, the lack of distinction that will add to the life and vitality of the painting because it involves the viewer more into letting them finish the shapes for themselves. When every detail is spelled out, it's sort of an affront to the viewer's intelligence, really, like they're not smart enough to figure things out, and I think they tend to tune out. As an artist, I mentioned earlier, you're not supposed to act like a camera. You should be able to share your unique vision of the subject without having to spell out every detail and to share what your impression of that subject is. Anything you can do to create a conversation with the viewer, the more they'll be engaged with your work. Watercolor has the ability to say a lot with very few strokes. It's surprising how little information it takes to convince the viewer of something. Um, we're really masters of illusion as painters. If you can capture the viewer's attention in the focal area and then assign other areas of the painting to be quieter by employing techniques like blurring and blending, you'll create a lovely sense of ambiguity and suggestion, which is much more poetic than everything spilled out, spelled out. So what are some techniques that we can use in watercolor to help create ambiguity or mystery? We can lose details, wet in wet, by letting paint blur together. We can paint the background very subtly, very light, so it doesn't compete with the main focal area. We can choose details to um, support and to paint stronger, and other details to leave out entirely. We can allow areas in shadow area to dissolve into one another so that distinction is blurred and the eye can pass over that easily. We can paint on a slant so gravity helps shapes meld into each other. We can simplify tonal values by joining things of similar values into larger shapes. We can leave an irregularity to an edge to make it much more appealing to the eye so not everything is completely finished. I like what Charles Reed has to say um, about that. He says, another word for finished is dead. So sometimes finishing too much in a painting can kill it. Shapes that are all filled in and completely hard edged, like that top circle that I showed, draw attention to themselves. So keeping background elements subdued um, will help not overpower the focal point. We should paint the way the human eye sees. Our peripheral vision is such that we see soft and blurred edges that won't compete with what we're looking at straight on. Um, I want to share one example of what I think um, is a really good example of looking at these techniques in action in a little painting by, um, this is by Stephen Scott Young. It's really one of my favorite paintings for leaving things unsaid because look at what he's done here. Um, this whole fence is lost to the, to the view, but our eye has no problem knowing that that fence continues out here. Same with the feet on the model. They're not even in the painting, but we know that they're there. And up here at the top where he's painted around these... Um, posts of the fence, he didn't fill in the whole area of the painting surface. He's left a lot of the area of the painting virtually unpainted. And we see some of his pencil marks to see where he's thinking. I just think this is an extremely emotional piece because of the very reason um, that we're talking about, that he has let the viewer have a part in completing this little painting. And I think it's brilliant. I just think it's uh, an excellent way to, um, to create something that's captivating and very intriguing and interesting all at once. So today I am going to attempt to paint something in a little bit of this fashion. 
I've got on my board here a subject that I'll be working from. And I would like to point out that sometimes um, a way to help you see this way and to be able to see uh, at where you can lose detail is to paint something in bright sunlight. Uh, because what that will do, sunlight has um, the ability to eat out detail in the, in the subject. As you can see here, what I'm going to attempt to do is to try to let that stay as white paper all in through here um, so, that the, so that you get a beautiful design here that isn't finished off and these, uh, this window won't be a completely closed in rectangle like that circle. So it'll be just a really, um, hopefully a really loose painting that I'll be working on. So I'm going to get started. And what I'm going to do on this painting, I'm not going to do really a traditional underpainting like I usually start with. I think what I'm going to do is start with my uh, second um, triad, which will be using some darker pigments or pigments that can go to a value nine or 10, because I would really like to get this shadow area in, in one go. That's another thing that can really um, help make this style work, is if you don't keep going back in and reworking things. So I'm going to start out putting in a wash um, with a, mm, I think I'll start out with a, a kind of a big, this is a sable brush, Rosemary and Company Kalinsky number 10. And so I'm gonna be using, I think in this painting, I'm gonna even go to my deepest blue, which is um, phthalo blue. Bring that in. And then my red is going to be uh, my transparent, uh, or sorry, my permanent alizarin crimson. You can already see what a beautiful dark, uh, dark I'm getting in there. And then I'm going to use, well, for this starting part, I'm going to use um, transparent oxide red for my equivalent of my yellow of the triad. So look at those delicious darks that are melting and blending there on the palette. I'm not stirring them together. I'm just letting them touch each other and feed in. But as I bring them onto the paper, I'll be bringing them on mostly as individual pigments and letting them uh, start to blend in together to each other. Because I do, I do want that, um, I'm gonna t add a touch of cat in here too, because um, I can see that there's kind of probably gonna be some warm reflection in that, that little under uh, cropping of the roof there. And then I, what I'm going to do now is just follow this um, pattern of light and shade going right over everything that is um, in shadow. And being careful to um, leave these beautiful, really beautiful little uh, white, white pieces of light. And I'm just letting all those colors merge and blend into themselves. Just kind of doing what they do on their own best. Gonna skip over those little areas there. I am 
uh, kind of getting into a purple here on the palette that I I want to use here on this. And then um, these little these little uh, things down in here, um, these little shadows here. Do you see how they they indicate that there's a uh, a ledge there because the shadows are slanting over that. That can, um, the shadows can indicate form on the object. And I want to catch that. That little shadow right under there. And otherwise, this is going to just be left as um, pretty much white paper out there. And I'm going to just indicate a little bit of that, um, the slats in that uh, sh shingle there, or shutter, I guess it is. Um, I only need to show three, and then the eye will figure out what else, what's really there. So, like I was saying earlier, they're just really, it just doesn't really require a whole lot in watercolor to describe what what you want the viewer to see. Okay, and then I want to keep coming down over here with this beautiful shadow color. Not really bringing in too much of the too much of the burnt or uh, transparent oxide red, but see that beautiful gray that is created when um, when that comes in. There's that little. Um, light right there on the shutter I'm trying to leave and then these beautiful little spots of of white coming down into the flower uh, and I think I just covered up a white that I kind of want to leave back here I'm uh, just continuing here coming down in this window and already, ooh, I think that's so pretty with the just those little spots of the sunlight, the patterns of that sunlight on the uh, brick wall there and on those shutters. Um, but do you see how quickly you can describe all of that in one go? And hopefully, uh, hopefully I've got this dark enough that I'm not going to need to really go back and readjust my values, which I don't want to do. And I'm leaving myself a bit of a, a bit of a stopping place down here. And I am going to start coming in with uh, some green anytime soon here. This just um, 
gets so exciting when you're painting this way. It, wow. I'm going to bring in some yellow now um, over in here. And this is a bright uh, cad yellow here to um, a warm yellow, yellow, <laughs> yellow that's going to um, describe those flowers. But don't worry that they're so clunky right now. I'll come back and define, define those. That didn't really look like cadmium yellow. I don't know. But anyway, okay. And now I want to also start um, bringing in a green. So I'm going to use the phthalo blue and cadmium here. I want it to be a nice rich green. That was, um, I added some burnt sienna or or transparent oxide red in there. So I'm gonna, while that's a little bit damp there, I'm gonna start putting in a little bit of that green. And then working down here too. Um, I can see that there's a really beautiful, um, almost a purple cast to the, some of those leaves in there. So I'm gonna, gonna kind of carry that in around here. And I'm just painting around right now the, the shapes of those, um, these are my hibiscuses, and they are so pretty. They, <laughs> I didn't know that they could really grow in the climate where I live, but they can. And they are trying to do it. Okay, now I see, back over in here, I do wanna go back to a deep, really deep green. It's not deep enough. That's more wet, what I was wanting. Okay, and down in here, um, I want to leave uh, kind of a raggedy type edge. So that is what I'm going to try to do. And I want to kind of highlight some of this foliage that's in the sun just a little bit. And I don't know, maybe I'll let that connect down to, uh, down to the bottom of the page there. And then over in here, I've got a really nice dark too that I want to get in. Quickly, I'm gonna, I'm going to, uh, paint this as a positive space right here and kind of let some of that bright bright yellow in the foliage bleed down into my dark I 
can see just some little touches of some flowers back in there. So this is an example of letting the letting the color blur and blend to um, draw, rather not draw attention away from the from the main part of the painting, which to me is going to be these flowers right in here, I think. And then again, we've got a shadow showing the curvature of this little, uh, what do you call that, a little cement curb coming along there. And right along there too. And let's, I'd like some kind of, that's going to be just a subtle little shadow coming, coming down under that flower. So I don't, I don't really want that to be too dark. But I'm gonna I'm gonna blur that a little bit with just by letting it, adding some clear water there and letting the pigment run, so that that ju- that edge of that just gets lost. Okay, and then um, typically I would get my blow dryer and dry this all really well, but at this point I, I've got a dry area here and I'm going to um, change to a smaller brush, a number eight low Cornell, and I'm going to start adding some of the pink in these flowers. Actually, I think I'll start out with um, this is a cadmium red medium and I think the center on these is Gonna be a bright red like that, and then fade out into the pink. By not adding a purple into that. Um, mixture on the flower. It seems to me to dull the color when I do that. So I'm going to just work with the pink. The pink itself and just use it more concentrated as um, in the center there. on that little edge of the I want that really pale
Um, I, I want to put a little touch of yellow in there too. Get that little stem thing in there. Okay, this one's kind of an interesting shape right here. I don't want every one of the flowers to be facing the facing you or it looks I don't know, kind of fake. Okay, so you're beginning to see at least my pattern of um, my mid values and my lights. Starting to emerge here, I think. Okay, this guy. I blot that color out, it, it looks a lot pinker, doesn't it? Okay, I've kind of um, kind of added a few flowers that aren't really there, but I'm not the camera, right? Okay, so I've got those flowers in. And now, um, working back up into here, I'm going to come in with some pretty strong mixtures of those same colors. Get a little bit of green. I can see right behind that flower. Up in there and then kind of a high key green, getting that in here. In spots. Okay, so I'm going to come back up here now and start a little bit on these window I had my um, my 
horizon line going right through there, which will help me uh, to know where my perspective slants up or slants down. And I'm not really being too careful on these uh, windows. So I don't want to spell every single thing out, like we were talking about earlier. Some of this I will want to blur together too. So we'll give it just a nice little whack with the brush and leave a little bit of that unsaid there. a little bit out with the towel here and there. And now's probably a good place where I can do a little more work on showing you that that's the shutter right here. Pulling a little bit of that out. All right, so I've got that window. Um, looking pretty good. I think I might want to indicate the uh, top of it there a little bit. And maybe just a hint of the edge of the shutter there. And that is just showing that there's some brickwork above there. So as I was saying before, you can see how very little is needed to describe that, but your eye knows that that is bricks somehow. And then down here, again, I'm going to be Painting in some positive foliage shapes. Right down around this little guy here. And here. And over in here. And now here's where I can start to define by my um, My sunflowers, that's what they are. By painting around them. But I don't want to, um, see I want to just kind of keep pulling all this looseness down. And there we 
is some orange in there. I'll come back and put some centers in those so they do look like sunflowers. And it looks like maybe there's one or two over here that we should kind of include. Then, now, I'm going to start defining uh, this dark foliage, leaving some of these things. Now, see, you'll start to see these beautiful um, purple leaves start coming forward. I want to leave um, kind of a lot of that purple. I think that's really pretty in there. And then up in here, there's got to be a few darks, too. And um, now this is the third layer of uh, dimension as I'm coming back and leaving some of that lighter wash showing underneath. And I don't want that to be all really hard edged, so I'm going to soften out some of it a little bit. You can see a few little pokes of green in there, so a, a brighter green. So I'll just add a little bit of yellow to heighten that a little. And then down in here, I'm going to go really deep with maybe even uh, some alizarin and crimson added in there so that this is a quiet corner of the painting over here. And it's not going to compete with these beautiful flowers over in here. But I'll let a little bit of that, um, I don't know, a few little Um, leaves poke out from underneath there, not much there. And then it, it sort of looks like now this is the shadow of that. Let that just run down into there. And probably there isn't any white there. There's just, I don't know, there's this pretty kind of color of foliage that is sort of a brownish purple. It's very, very pretty in there. And if I put it in while some of that underwash is still wet, see, it just kind of blends in and looks beautiful, I think. And then this dark over here is going to set off this little area of flowers right there. Very nicely when I come back around there. I don't really want to cover up all that 
pretty nuts that I already had down there. So what I'm going to do is kind of just smooth this around. And hopefully that's still letting some of that really pretty color underneath there come through. Okay. I need some darks in here. Don't be afraid to go too dark in your paintings. That it oftentimes that's the weak point as we don't we don't allow the values to really go as as deep as they should or need to And I don't really want that too hard edged in there. So I'm going to blur that back a little bit. But I still want a little bit of dimension in those in those leaves. So I don't want to cover all of that. But that's, that's how you build dimension, it's just by continually building up the darks on top of those lights. Okay, and I'm going to put a little bit of a, a deeper shadow under here so, so that we can tell that that's the, the underside of those windows. And I'm also having to eat my words again here. These, um, some of this needs to be darker in here. To set that off. And so I just, I kind of want to keep, um, Putting in um, pops of my my original triad, um, so I want to I want to include that uh, but I don't I don't want to get muddy. can happen when you start going back in like I'm doing. But that's going to really um, need to be that dark. And then I'll let um, some of the rest of that window just sort of blur blur up into there. Now I can bring a little bit more of the a little bit more of those edges of the shutters by pulling that wet paint over.
Okay. And then the same thing. Just pop some. Some uh, straight color in here is kind of fun to do. Just let that blur and bleed. Because it really would have some of that green foliage reflecting back in there. But now that's a nice, a pretty nice window that is not all spelled out in rectangles. Right? And I don't need to finish off the entire top of it because I know that you know, that your eye knows that that's a window. Okay, then we're going to get a little bit more of that over here. And then we're going to really see this. Um, this window take shape, but not too much. And then where it's going to get lost is down here. to come over that white bar thingy there. Then we've got, again, that little slanted business that's showing us that that is where the window ledge is. And now I'm going to, I am going to give a little bit of uh, dimension up here to the edge of the rain gutter, whatever that is. I hope that's the right decision. I could probably let have let that just go. And maybe I will um, give this a little bit of a line under it, not all the way across there. Just kind of indicate where that 
yeah, goes, and then maybe a little bit of, again, the um, the brickwork across the top, like I did over here. So I think I'm about done here um, with this uh, with this little demo. It's very loose, and in some eyes, it probably is not good. But I love the um, I love the understated, and I think it is really an important tool to incorporate into your paintings to help you involve the viewer and to um, add more poetic feeling to your paintings. I'm, I'd like to put a mat on this little finished piece. Watercolor kind of requires a mat, and um, I'm I really am quite happy with this. I think it. Um, says what I wanted it to say. Um, I don't know if I'll, if I'll do anything more to it. It seems like this, this needs to be a little darker in through here, but for now I'm going to call it. And thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear your comments and um, read the things that you share with me. So I hope you'll come back when we post a new video. Thank you again, bye-bye. Um, cut. Just a sec. Okay, I'll come back in here just a minute. Go, oh, it's cut. Go up a little farther. I'm going to skip this part, this next paragraph. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Let me say that sentence again. Hi, and welcome to uh, start over. Three room if they're not in the pantry, and a thing of salsa in the outside fridge. Hi, welcome to my YouTube channel, Laurel Heartwork. Um, this is a, okay, one more time. <laughs> um, as an artist, as I mentioned above, uh, you're, uh,